Reformation Sunday, and every year on this Sunday, we remember the Protestant Reformation, where there was a real recovery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when there was a, a period for many years of darkness in the church, and then God revived the church. And so each year, we try to take a few minutes on these Sundays to talk together about the faithfulness of God and how he has recovered the gospel and how he's continuing to do that afresh. And I pray he would do that in our hearts. So you can stay at Nehemiah 8 for just a second. Um, the average American home today has 4.4 Bibles. Now, I'm not sure what four-tenths of a Bible is, but that's what the statistic is. I guess that's someone who really read theirs and it fell apart. We have Bibles on CD. We have MP3 uh, podcasts that you can listen to the Bible. You can hear the Bible on the radio. You can read it free online in multiple translations. If you have a smartphone, just one app that I know of has a thousand different languages of the Bible to read it. Churches give out Bibles for free. Uh, you can go to the Dollar Tree and purchase a Bible for a dollar. The Gideons have Bibles in every hotel room almost in North America. We have Bible translations galore. We are a people in this country who have great freedom and access to the Word of God. And yet I would say to you as we begin this morning, we are a people that take the Bible for granted. Now, in a few months, we are going to celebrate what is called the incarnation, the coming of Jesus Christ into the world, God entering the world. He comes to us, he takes a body, and he lives among us. And this doctrine of the incarnation is a beautiful truth that we will celebrate. However, it is not simply limited to Jesus coming into the world 2,000 years ago. I think the idea of God coming into the world is also at the heart of the Bible itself. It is the word of God coming to the people of God, coming to us where we are. And so today I want to talk about William Tyndale and God's word for the nations. And I want to really answer the question, how did you even get an English Bible? Why do we have the blessing of so many translations and availability of scripture? And why is that important for us today? When we talk about the incarnation, we think about Jesus. And the Bible says he was from the beginning. Before this world was, Jesus was there. And then John says, when he came into the world, we heard him, we saw him with our eyes, we, we looked upon him, and we even touched him with our hands. He was the word of life, and his life was made manifest to us. The idea is God chose to have a physical presence amongst us in this world when Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He literally was here. He literally was heard by the senses of those who listened to him and touched by those who Jesus healed. And, and literally, um, they handled the word of life. They saw God in their midst. It's interesting that God's physical presence is now embodied through his word. God has chosen to be a God who reveals himself in a verbal way. Think, from the beginning of the Bible, in creation, what did God do? He spoke and he said what? Let there be light. And there was light. And he has chosen to reveal himself, not just in creation verbally, but even through the prophets, through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the prophets of old and Israel and then the apostles and then we have the very words of God today that we've just read. In fact, we read here in Nehemiah chapter 8. This was a great revival that was taking place amongst the people of Israel. And they were at the water gate in Jerusalem. And we're told that Ezra, who was a scribe, he opened the Bible up before the people. And he began to read. It says, he opened the book in the sight of all the people. He was above the people. And he blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, bowing their heads, and worshiping the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now notice verse 8. It says, they read from the book, from the Old Testament, from the law of God, assumingly Genesis through Deuteronomy. And they clearly gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. This is a section we could just kind of skip through quickly and not realize why it matters to you and me in this day and age. But this tells us a lot about 
the Bible, Bible translation, why we even have Bibles in our own language today. So Ezra and those with him first read the Bible out loud. We do that all the time in this church, and I hope you do it in your home. I hope you do it in your car. I hope you do it uh, whenever you have an opportunity. It, reading of the Bible is vitally important. Notice they read the law of God clearly, meaning plainly and intelligently. They read it to be heard and understood. Listen, the Bible was not given simply to be a good luck charm that we tuck away. It was given so that the words themselves would be unleashed in our lives. Now, this was for hours. We're only going to be here for a little under an hour and a half. They were there for hours, from morning to afternoon. And it says that they gave the sense of what was read. It wasn't simply to just speak words out loud. Words are good, but the meaning behind them is also integral to the power of the Bible. So here's what you need to understand. The Jews had been in captivity for a long period of time, 70 years at least. And in that captivity, many of them did not know the Hebrew language anymore. They had uh, learned the Chaldee, the language of Babylon. Many of them had learned Aramaic, which was a mixture language. They spoke in different dialects after being away. Remember, God originally gave his word to the Jewish people in the Hebrew language, and then the New Testament was given in the Greek language. But they began to give the sense so the people understood. In other words, the Bible was originally written in a different language, in a different culture, in a different place, at a far distant time. And translation helps us to understand who God is. It gives us the meaning of what God has said. It is incarnational. It brings the word of God to us. We don't understand it on our own, so he teaches us. He helps us to know him. It is most important not simply to have a Bible, but to know what it says. It's not just for our information. Friends, your Bible has been given so God would be with you for your transformation. The Word of God demands attention. It deserves attention. To many of us, by carelessness and drowsiness and distractions, we let so much stuff slip through. And we, I think, have a great danger in forgetfulness and not really remembering and meditating on what God has said. Now, here is a picture of the Bible as it was originally given. On your left, you see the Bible in Hebrew. That represents the Old Testament. On the right, you see it in Greek. That represents the New Testament. I assume there's just maybe one or two of us here. I think only two of us in this room today that can read what's on the screen before you. Most of us can't read the Bible as it was originally given. And so when you, when you read what happened here in Nehemiah, they read and they gave the sense. They took it from one language, the language God gave it, and they brought it into the language of the people and they explained what it meant so it had value to them. It's not just saying words. It's the thought, the intent that is vitally important. Now, let's think about the word, the world for just a minute. In the world today, there are 1,521 languages in which the New Testament and portions of the Old Testament have been taken from the Greek and the Hebrew and put into their own language. That's really good news, isn't it? And in fact, 670 languages have the complete translated Bible like we have it in English. To give you some sort of context, you've heard of uh, one of the most popular books outside of the Bible in the world today right now is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. That's one of the most read books around the world in our modern generation. That book has been translated into 67 languages. The Bible has been translated into 670 languages. And 1521 have the New Testament completed in their Bible today. Now here's that's good news. Here's the bad news. The bad news is there are 7,000 languages spoken in the world today that are our first language of people, which means 1.5 billion people do not have a full Bible in their first language. Now, they might be able to read it in a secondary language. We Americans uh, are very entitled, and most of us only know English, but many others around the world know more than one language. But I want you to think about this. There are 327 million people in the USA, and yet there's 1.5 billion who do not have the Bible in their first language. 
Now, to really break that down, that means there are 110 million people who do not have a single verse of Scripture in the world. They don't have the Bible yet. It's still Greek and Hebrew. It's never been brought to them so they can hear it and understand it and know it. This is a chart from Wycliffe Bible Translators, which is an organization that has given its entire existence to translating the Bible in every tongue in the world. And according to them, there are 1,859 languages that have no translation program at work. No one's taken it from the Greek and Hebrew and, and made it have sense into the language of the people, which affects 180 million people who have no access to the Word of God at all at this present time. Now, what does that have to do with Reformation Day? What does that have to do with William Tyndale? Take your Bible, please, now and turn to Revelation chapter 12. I want to turn there for just a moment. Revelation chapter 12. We are going now to the throne room of God. We're going to start here, and in about 30 minutes, we're going to end here. Revelation chapter 12. This is the throne of God. This is heaven. We see the worship of God, and we see very important words around this throne. Revelation 12, verses 9 and 10. Listen to the voice that we hear here in these verses. Revelation 12. Let's read verses 10 and 11. John says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. It's incarnation. Have come. For the accuser of our brethren of the believers who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. They did not love their lives to the death. We have two kingdoms here, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. We have here the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. The kingdom of the accuser of the brethren, Satan. And the kingdom of the king of kings, the lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice there was a war going on. And the people who follow Jesus, who follow the lamb, they overcame Satan. They overcame the kingdom of darkness, the accuser of our very souls. They overcame him to the death. In this war between the two kingdoms, there were many people on the side of light, on the side of truth, on the side of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who gave their very lives. They didn't shrink back when they were threatened with death. They remained firm. They did not cling to their earthly lives. They did not value their earthly lives for the sake of eternal life. If you don't think that your life is more important than someone else's life. If you don't think that your life here today is as important as what comes after this life, what can Satan really do to you? What threat can he really bring against you? If you really believe to live is Christ and to die is gain, then you can fit into this passage we read here. Had they loved their lives, they would have saved them by denying Jesus when the rubber met the road. They would have taken the easy way, the broad way. Satan's threats would have stopped them in their tracks. This is like Paul, what Paul the Apostle said in Acts chapter 20. He said, I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish the course and the ministry of Jesus, the gospel of the grace of God. And so they did not love their lives to the death, or even as far as death. Their love of their own lives, which we all love our life to some extent, was overcome by a stronger affection, a stronger life, love to Jesus and to his kingdom. The word love here is the word agape. It's the love of God. They did not love their own lives in some sort of a selfish way. Instead, they loved in a self-sacrificing way. They died to sin and self and Satan to gain Christ. This is what Jesus said, whoever loves his life will lose it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. 
They sealed the truth that they confessed with their blood. What does this have to do with William Tyndale? And what does this have to do with the Bible and Bible translation? Well, why are we talking about William Tyndale? Let's answer that question. The picture you see behind me is a painting of William Tyndale in the Dutch master style. Now, here's the truth. William Tyndale never sat down for this painting because he was a fugitive. He was running for his life in exile in the underground because Henry VIII wanted this man you see dead. The last thing someone who goes underground for 12 years and they're trying to kill does is sit down for a portrait. Now, why William Tyndale? Well, the reason why you have an English Bible today is God used this man you see behind me. He has been called by Ian Murray, the fountainhead of the whole Puritan movement. John Fox said he was God's apostle to England. Sir Frederick Kenyon said this, William Tyndale is the true father of the English Bible. His genius shows itself in the fact he was able to couch his translations in a language perfectly understood by the people, yet fuel, full of beauty and dignity. The man you see before you today is often called the architect of the English language. Even so, more than William Shakespeare. Because you see, when William Tyndale lived, there was no English dictionary. The wor many words that we have in our language today were invented by the man William Tyndale. Words like mercy seat and scapegoat and long suffering and tender mercies and Passover and Jehovah. In fact, it would be 150 years before there would be an English dictionary. And this man that you see gave God a voice in the English language. God was no longer hoarded or kept at a distance. This was incarnation. If you have a King James version of the Bible today, 90% of what your King James says is identical to what William Tyndale translated hundreds of years ago. If you have a modern version, 75% of your Bible is identical to what William Tyndale did years ago. And he loved not his life unto the death. In his 40s, he died so you could have the Bible today. Now, let's talk for a minute about the world before William Tyndale. Understand that we are spoiled rotten with all the ways we have to read the Bible. In Tyndale's day, people didn't have English Bibles. They had Latin Bibles. And guess what? Common people didn't read Latin. Let's go 100 years before William Tyndale. There was a man named John Wycliffe, and Wycliffe decided he, after reading the Bible in Latin, he came to the conclusion that many of the doctrines of the Church of Rome, like the Pope and purgatory and, and indulgences and other teachings of the Roman Catholic Church were not in line with the Scripture. And most of all, he felt very strongly that the Church was keeping the Bible from the people by doing all of the services in Latin, not the spoken language, and by not allowing the people of God to have the Bible in their own language. Now, Wycliffe was not a Greek scholar. He was not a Hebrew scholar. But he took the Latin Bible and he hand wrote a translation into, uh, into English. He was the first one to try to do this. It was a very inaccurate translation, but he did his best. And he was so hated and his life was so threatened for trying to do this that 44 years after he died, the Pope found where his bones were, and he had the bones of John Wycliffe dug up from the ground, crushed, burned, and scattered into a river. Because the church of that day did not want the people to have the Bible in their own language. Fast forward to one of Wycliffe's followers, a man named John Huss. He also had the same idea that the people should have the Bible in their own language. Now remember, there's no printing press. So if you want a copy of Wycliffe's Bible, you got to get a you know, quill and you got you to write it down. And so just to have a fragment, one page of the Bible in English in a very bad translation uh, would be a very great gift. And yet John Huss was burned at the stake and they took the copies that the church had seized of Wycliffe's uh, translation in the little single sheets of it, and they used that as kindling to burn that man alive for just promoting the idea that the Bible should be in the language of the people. In fact, his last words recorded were, in a hundred years, God will raise up a man whose cause for reform cannot be suppressed by the church. So the year was 
1401. And Henry IV and the Roman Catholic Church pronounced a law, De heretico cumberendo, on the burning of heretics, to make heresy punishable by burning people alive at the stake. If you owned a copy of, of Wycliffe's Bible, even one sheet, even just a prayer from the Bible in English, you could be burned alive. So, at that time, probably less than 1% of the English population had ever seen a Bible or even possessed a portion of a page of the Bible in their own language. Understand, there was no Bible study in that day. Nobody in that day was digging in the scriptures. There was no quiet time. You didn't uh, set your Bible on the, the uh, table and set your coffee cup there and take a selfie and have your highlighters to underline your devotions for the day and all that kind of stuff. If you don't use a highlighter, I question your own salvation. It's biblical, you know. And ladies, not three different colors, only yellow highlighters. Pink highlighters are heretical. Down with the pink ones. There, there was nothing like that. There was no devotions and, and warm, quiet times because you didn't have a copy of the Bible. It just wasn't available. You went to church. You listened to the Latin and Mass. You hoped your priest was saved and might explain to you what he read in Latin. In fact, one writer, John Bale, he was a dramatist. He said, he was born about a year after Tyndale. He said that as a boy of 11, I watched, watched the burning of a young, young man in Norwich for simply possessing the Lord's Prayer in English. Just because he had the prayer in English, that was considered heresy, and he was burnt. John Fox records, he watched seven Lollards, seven followers of Wycliffe, burned in 1519 for teaching the Lord's Prayer in English. At the heart of medieval Christianity, if it had a heart, was a reliance on fear and manipulation and control. Salvation was simply just escaping the flames of hell rather than lying on the lordship of Jesus Christ. Everything was in Latin, not the language of the people. And the church was absolutely paganized and corrupt. In fact, one writer has chronicled the, the era as priests running from the houses of a prostitute to the altar to perform mass. Incapable of understanding the Latin in which they mumbled their liturgies. Superstitious and worshipers of such relics as a gown of the Virgin Mary, a piece of the burning bush of Moses, straw from the manger of Bethlehem, a complete skeleton of one of the babies supposedly murdered by Herod the Great, drunkards and gluttons whose wicked lives were supported by the blood, sweat, and tears of the common working folk. And then he says later, sometimes they claim to be too, hu too holy for matrimony, but they were at liberty to keep concubines, prostitutes on the side. Friends, the, even the Roman Catholic Church admits this was a dark age in need of reform. And by the way, the Catholic Church has reformed in many, obviously, of these ways. These kinds of things are not the standard anymore. In fact, a man who studied with Tyndale at Oxford, John Hooper, who became a bishop in the church, he did a survey as a bishop of the, the, the clergy in that day. And of 311 members of the clergy under him, nine priests did not know there were Ten Commandments. 33 had no clue the Ten Commandments were in the Bible. They could not recite the Lord's Prayer. 30 did not know Jesus said the Lord's Prayer in the first place. In fact, John Hooper eventually himself would be burned at the stake during the reign of Mary Tudor for his faith. It was a very dark day indeed. So what's William Tyndale got to do with it? That's the question the next few minutes. Well, he's born somewhere around 1494, 1495 in Gloucestershire, England. We know very little about his childhood. We know this. He went to the University of Oxford at 8 to 12 years old, about the year 1506, to study, to be a priest. Um, kids, I want you to hear this. Some of you guys hate going to school, but you don't know your education, what God could do with your education one day. A lot of you guys like to grumble about homework and studying, but I want you to hear Tyndale's story. There is value in knowledge. We're told to love God with all of our minds. So Tyndale, by the year 1512, has a Bachelor of Arts degree. He's 18 years old. And then he learn, earns the Master of Arts degree by 1515. By the end of his life, 
He can speak seven languages like they're his mother tongue. English, Latin, Greek, Spanish, Italian, French, and German. Most of us are still trying to learn the English language. Simply amazing. He's ordained a deacon in the church. And yet, all of his time in studying at Oxford, he says he, he never heard the Bible. He was studying to be a priest, yet he never heard the Bible. He said, they have so, in the universities, they have ordained that men should not look on the scripture until they've been nursed in heathen learning eight or nine years and armed with false ideas, false, false principles, with which he has clean shut out the understanding of the scripture. And by the way, we live in a day where you can't even mention the Bible in class anymore. How interesting is that we are coming back to the dark ages in modern education. Now, after Oxford, he went to Cambridge in 1519 to master the Greek language. Now, Cambridge was interesting. It was a hotbed for the Protestant teachings. It was around that time, obviously two years earlier, that Martin Luther had nailed the 95 Theses on the, the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And during this time, uh, the writings of Luther were being spread across the world, including making their way to England, making their way to Cambridge. And there was a pub, an inn, called the White Horse Inn there in Cambridge, where William Tyndale would meet with other men who came, became great heroes of the faith, and they would study the scriptures together. And it was during this time, we believe, that Tyndale actually went from being an academic who knew Latin and knew Greek to becoming a Christian as he read one of Luther's books uh, about the Bible and about the gospel. He trusted in Jesus Christ and his life was changed. Now, in that day, salvation was only for monks and nuns and priests and you had to work and work and give and give only in hopes to not suffer in purgatory for thousands of years. And yet Tyndale read the gospel. One writer says he was saved from reading the Latin Bible. Others suggest it was reading Luther's works and he read the sermons of Luther and he heard the gospel. Either way, this is what Tyndale said after becoming saved. He said, the New Testament is the everlasting promises made to us in Christ the Lord throughout all the scripture. It is built on faith and not works. It is not said of the, the Testament. He, now listen, he's about to quote the Bible. No one knew, no one had heard this in English before. He's taking the Bible and translating it for the first time in this writing that he has here. It does not say he that works will live, but he that believes will live. As you read in John 3, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that none which believe in him should perish but have life everlasting. How radical this is. Everyone's scared to death they're going to go to hell in purgatory forever because they're not good enough. And he's saying, no, Jesus did the work. You need to believe. The Spirit enters the heart and gives life. The Spirit makes the law a lively thing in the heart. Tyndale believed in the, the gospel of the Reformation, the gospel of the Bible. So, Tyndale said, in contrast to the, the false gospel of that day, the true gospel is good and merry, glad, joyful tidings. It's not doom and gloom. It makes your heart glad. It makes you sing and dance and leap for joy. When you realize it's not what you've done, it's what Jesus has done that saves you. I will rejoice in the Lord and joy in the God of my salvation, Habakkuk 3, 18. So at about 26 or 27, he's finished his education and he knows he cannot serve in the Roman church. It's too dark, it's too corrupt. And so he takes a very humble job. In the year 1521, he goes back to Gloucestershire and he serves as a tutor in the family of Sir John Welsh, who was a knight he becomes a schoolmaster for his sons. Now, that might seem a very humble job for a man who's a great, brilliant academic, a Christian, a preacher of the gospel. But Tyndale believed that no matter what you do, no matter what your job is in this room, you can do it for God. This is the doctrine of vocation. He said, there's no work that is better than to please God, whether you're pouring water or washing dishes, a cobbler, a shoemaker, or an apostle, they're all one. To, watch, to wash dishes and to preach are all one. They all can please God. Or as Colossians 3 says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So while he is uh, a schoolmaster, he's starting to read and study the Greek New Testament. 
and learning about how the Bible was originally written in Greek. And he's also going around, he's preaching. There's one little church in England, it's the only one, called St. Adeline Church. He's preaching there on the Lord's Day. He's talking to the people in the village back home. He's, he's learning the way people speak. And he's paying high attention to this. And it's also very interesting that in that day and age, Sir John Welsh was a very wealthy man as a knight. And remember, there was no Motel 6s or Holiday Inns or Denny's or McDonald's. And so as a very wealthy man, uh, clerics, religious leaders that were traveling through this town would stay at his house overnight. He would uh, open his dinner table for hospitality. And many of these clergy would come in and they would come to the table and they had no idea who was sitting there was this brilliant, on-fire Christian named William Tyndale. And Tyndale would always talk with them about the gospel and about why doesn't the church allow the Bible and the language of the people? And they would get so frustrated with him. And, and word began to spread that Tyndale was a heretic because he wanted people to know the Bible in their own language. In fact, there is one occasion uh, that we have uh, in which Tyndale's having a discussion with a priest who was a great doctor in religion. And the priest said, we are better to be without God's laws than the popes. In other words, he was saying, forget the Bible, we need the pope. And the priest said this, he said, um, we are better to be without God's laws than the popes. And Tyndale said, I defy the pope and all his laws, which is a good way to get yourself killed in that era. And then he said, if God spares my life many years, I will cause a boy that drives the plow, a boy that works out in the field to know more of the scriptures than you do. From that day on, that became Tyndale's passion to get the Bible in the hands of the people. There were three million people in England that time that Tyndale had a heart to have the Bible in their own language. In fact, he said, we have 20,000 clergy that know no scripture except for what's in their clerical, mat, their clerical manuals. He said, it is impossible to establish the lay people with the truth except the scripture is before their eyes in their own mother tongue, your language today that you speak of English. And so Tyndale um, is threatened. He's, he's called in different meetings where uh, people are very harsh with him because of his ideas. And he realizes that he needs to go to the, the number one source in London, the Bishop of London, to speak to him about translating the Bible into English in hopes there would be a chance for him to do this. So he goes to the Bishop of England, Bishop Cuthbert Tonstall, and he has to wait two weeks to get an audience with the bishop. He finally is granted an audience with the bishop, and the bishop tells him these words after Tyndale lays out why he wants a Bible in the English language. He says, I have neither room for you nor for your translation work. And he told him to get out and never to come back. Now, why are they so opposed to the Bible in the English language? Why do they tell Tyndale to beat it and never bring it up again? Because at that day and age, there was a man named Martin Luther. Martin Luther, who in 1522 in Germany had just translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into German. And all of a sudden, the people read the Bible in their own language. There was this great revival, but there was also a great revolt against the darkness of their leaders and the darkness of the church. They stood for something. And these corrupt bishops in England were so afraid that if the people read the Bible, they wouldn't support them in their unjust and ungodly practices. They wouldn't be so afraid to have to give all of their money because they think if they don't give their money, they're going to suffer in purgatory. And so Tyndale realizes, like Abraham of old, that he's going to have to leave his homeland if he wants to do this work. There is no safety for him to translate the Bible in England. So in 1524, at the age of 30, he fled his homeland as a refugee for the last 12 years of his life. We get a little sampling of his life as a refugee in a letter he wrote. He speaks of my pains and my poverty and my exile out of my natural country. He says, the bitter absence from my friends, never saw his family or friends again. My hunger, my thirst, my cold, the great danger there with I had everywhere I went. And finally, innumerable other hard and sharp fightings which I endured. Listen, so you could have an English Bible. He would never marry. 
In fact, he would never even be buried, you'll find out in a moment. He gave his whole life for this cause. So he flees to Hamburg, Germany. He goes there. Then he goes to Wittenberg, Germany, where the Reformation is spreading. It's possible he met Martin Luther at this time. He begins to teach himself Hebrew. Again, you have to be a brilliant person to teach yourself Hebrew. Almost no one knew Hebrew in that day and age, but he knows the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. In fact, uh, after Tyndale, John Calvin was one of the few church leaders that were alive in that day that actually knew the Hebrew language. So after 11 months being away, he begins this work of translating the Bible into the English language. Friends, it's amazing. He completes this work in the city of Worms, the city where Martin Luther said, here I stand, I can do no other. So they print for the first time ever 6,000 New Testaments. Remember, the Gutenberg printing press has just come onto the scene. Well, they can't bring these Bibles back into England. The Bible is outlawed. You die if you have a copy of the Bible. So they have to smuggle them in England and Scotland in bales of cotton, in boxes of food, in sacks of grain. And they, they distribute them far and wide to the people, these 6,000 Bibles. They were jewels. They were treasures to the people of England. Well, do you remember that Bishop Tunstall of London? Word gets to him that Tyndale's Bible that he has now translated, just the New Testament, mind you, is getting into the hands of the people. So he writes a letter, and this is what he says about Tyndale's Bible. Listen, now remember, he's talking about the Bible. This is a Catholic bishop talking about the Bible. He says, it is intermingled with heretical depravity, pernicious, erroneous opinions, pestilent, scandalous, seductive of simple minds of which translation many books containing pestilent and pernicious poison in the vulgar tongue have been dispersed in great numbers throughout our diocese. It will speedily, unless it, it be speedily foreseen, it will infect and contaminate the flock with pestilent poison. I mean, who talks about God's word like that? But they hated the Bible. They didn't want you to have the Bible. And Satan today does not want you to have the Bible. He doesn't mind you having it as long as you don't read it. As long as you don't know what it says. You can have a Latin one. You can have an English one if you don't crack it open. Tyndale went on record. He said, I call God to record against the day we will appear before our Lord Jesus. I never once altered any syllable of God's word against my conscience, nor would I do so this day. If all that is in earth, whether it be my honor, pleasure, or riches, might be given to me. Amazing. Friends, uh, there was a man who was a, a very wealthy merchant, and he heard how angry Bishop Tunstall was. And so he went to the bishop and he said, I have an idea. Why don't we buy all of these New Testaments back? Let's offer huge sums of money to buy the New Testaments back from the people that have them to get them off the streets. And the bishop said, that's a good idea. How much money do you need? And he gave a very high price. And so what the bishop didn't know is this guy was actually a friend of William Tyndale and was a Protestant. He had been saved by reading the New Testament himself. So he took the money, and he went to Germany, and he gave the money to William Tyndale for the second printing of the New Testament in the English language. <laughs> now, things start to get hard. They have now said Tyndale is to be killed. He's a heretic. And so Tyndale hears about how the printer who had first printed Tyndale's Bible was caught, tortured, and killed. His friend John Frith was arrested in London and tried by Thomas More and burned alive July 4th, 1531 at 28 for spreading the New Testament. Richard Bayfield, who ran the ships that took Tyndale's books to Scotland and England, was betrayed, arrested, and burned alive. Pretty soon, Tyndale's cover was blown as he was hiding out in Germany. There were English spies trying to kill him. And so for nine months... He went from Frankfurt to Hamburg to Cologne to Antwerp to Mondiburg. And there in Mondiburg, he spent nine months translating the Old Testament, Genesis to Deuteronomy, without ever taking a Hebrew class at Oxford or Cambridge. Now listen to this. He takes these manuscripts with him. He has to get on a ship because he has to flee for his life. And as he's on this ship, the ship suffers shipwreck. There's no computers there's no control S. There's no cloud at that time. 
His entire translation, handwritten of Genesis to Deuteronomy, is lost in the shipwreck. It's ruined. Nine months of his, months of his life, gone. So, he takes an entire year and he retranslates Genesis to Deuteronomy. And then he translates Joshua the Second Chronicles. And then he translates the prophet Jonah in hiding. And then he makes 4,000 changes to his New Testament. Again, that final New Testament, 4,000 changes are 90% identical to the King James Version you have today. Yet he's still hiding for his life. Let's talk about the end of his life with the last moments we have. A man of the character of Judas Iscariot is hired by King Henry to betray Tyndale. He had lost all of his father's estate in a gambling uh, debt. And so the church and Henry promised to restore his gambling debt and his father's estate if he could betray Tyndale. And so this devil... uh, finds out where Tyndale is, gets close to him, and betrays him and has him arrested. Tyndale is taken to the castle of Vivordi, 18 miles from Antwerp. He spends the last 18 months of his life in prison. The charge, why is he in a dank, cold prison for 18 months? Heresy. Basically, he was a Lutheran. He had translated the Bible into the English language. He was without heat, without light from candles or lamps. He does not have sufficient clothing. John Piper writes that those months in prison were a long, dying death. We have a letter that Tyndale wrote as he's in prison at the end of his life to an unnamed officer of the castle prison he was in. And this is what he says. I beg your lordship and that of the Lord Jesus that if I am to remain here through the winter, meaning if he's not going to be killed before the winter that you would request the commissary to have the kindness to send me from the goods of mine, which he has, a warmer cap, for I suffer greatly from cold in my head, and I am afflicted. And he says, a warmer coat, the one I have is thin, a piece of cloth to patch my leggings. My overcoat is worn out. My shirts are also worn out. A woolen shirt, if he would be good enough to send it, and leggings of thicker cloth. I also ask to be allowed to have a lamp in the evening. It is indeed wearisome to sit alone in the dark. But most of all, I beg and beseech your clemency to be urgent with the commissary that he will kindly permit me to have the Hebrew Bible, a Hebrew grammar and a Hebrew dictionary, that I may pass the time in that study. In return, you may obtain what you most desire, so only that it be for the salvation of your soul. But if any other decision has been taken concerning me to be carried out before winter, I will be patient, abiding the will of God. We don't know if his requests were granted. We know this, the jailer and his daughter and his household came to Jesus. Tyndale shared the gospel with them and they were saved during those last months of his life. In August 1536, Tyndale is condemned as a heretic. He's defrocked from the priesthood because of his faith and justification by faith alone. He suffers the last few months of his life in dungeon until October 1536, the year that John Calvin publishes the Institutes of the Christian Religion. A vertical post is erected. And this would be Tyndale's ladder to heaven. A chain or a rope is wrapped around Tyndale's neck to the top of this post to keep his head upright during the burning. Green twigs are placed around his feet to produce smoke to burn slowly. What is his charge? He translated the Bible into English. Formalities included uh, placing the mass in Tyndale's hand and then quickly snatching it back, refusing to give him forgiveness. Tyndale's last words as the smoke were coming up and suffocating and choking him were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Friends, God answered that prayer in the Bible you have in your hand today. The executioner immediately pulled on the rope to strangle him. Listen to this. The fire was lit again, and they had wrapped gunpowder around the second tier, and it literally exploded and blew Tyndale up. 42 years old, never married, never buried, he won the martyr's crown. All this so you could have the Bible in the English language. And by the way, God answered that prayer 
Because not long after that, one of his friends from the White Horse Inn, Thomas Cramner, became the bishop, and the king changed his mind and allowed the Bible to be in the hands of the people. How precious is the word of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Friends, I ask you today, on this Reformation Sunday, do you believe, do you cherish the gift of the Bible? This was a man who fits Revelation 12. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. The accuser of our brethren, Satan, who you accused Tyndale before our God day and night has been cast down. And Tyndale overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That's the word of God. And they did not love their lives to the death. The Bible is such a precious gift. And I ask you today, friend, do you believe it? Do you believe this word? Has it changed you? Is it alive in you? Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Oh, that God would awaken us from our slumber, from our drowsiness, and that we would love his word. And we would be a people of this word as we surrender to Christ our Lord. May we bow before him in prayer.